Okay, welcome back to lecture eight. Uh, today we're going to talk about CNN architectures. And this is, really, this is really getting into the details of convolutional neural networks. Hopefully this will be pretty interesting. So the last, in the last lecture, we, la we left off talking about convolutional networks. In particular, in the last lecture, we talked about these different, in, these different building blocks that we can use to build up convolutional networks. And we saw that convolutional neural networks are just neural networks that are built up of convolution layers, pooling layers, fully connected layers, some activation function, probably ReLU, and some normalization layer, often batch normalization. But we were left with a big question of how do we actually combine these basic ingredients to actually uh, hook up and make big, uh, high-performing convolutional neural networks? Um, now even once you've defined these operations, you have a lot of freedom in how you might just choose to stick them together, what the hyperparameters are going to be, and just knowing these basic ingredients is far from enough to know how to actually get good performance out of convolutional neural networks. Um, so rather than leaving you totally in the dark, today we're going to cover um, a historical overview of many different types of deep convolutional neural network architectures that people have used over the past few years or so. And a good way to ground this discussion is in the ImageNet classification challenge. Remember, we talked about the ImageNet data set in the first uh, two lectures, that it was this very large-scale data set for image classifi classification um, that had about 1.2 million training images, and uh, classifiers, uh, classification networks had to recognize about uh, 1,000 different categories in this uh, 1.2 1 million data, uh, image data set for training. And ImageNet was, very, was, was a huge benchmark for image classification because they held a yearly challenge from 2010 to, to 2017 where different teams would enter their best performing uh, image classification system and everyone around the world would compete against each other to try to build the best classification system. And the ImageNet classification challenge really drove a lot of research and a lot of intense progress in convolutional neural, net neural network design over the past several years. So uh, I thought it would be useful to ground this discussion by stepping through and talking about some of the, some of the highest performing winners in the different years of the ImageNet competition. As we've already seen, in 2010 and 2011, the first two years the competition was run, uh, the, the winning systems were not neural network based at all. They were these compositions of uh, multiple layers of, of uh, hand-designed features together with some linear classifier on top. But in 2012, as you should probably remember by now, was the year that convolutional neural networks first became a huge mainstream topic in computer vision research when the AlexNet architecture um, just crushed all the other competition on the ImageNet challenge in 2012. So what, is act so what actually did AlexNet look like? Well, AlexNet was a deep convolutional neural network. Um, by today's standards, I think it actually wouldn't be considered that deep, as we'll see as we go on through the lecture. But AlexNet accepted uh, 227 by 227 pixel inputs. It had five convolutional layers. It used max pooling th throughout. And it had three, three fully connected layers that followed the convolutional layers. And it used ReLU nonlinearities throughout. And in fact, AlexNet was one of the first major uh, convolutional neural networks that used ReLU nonlinearities. Um, another, there's a couple other kind of quirks and features of the AlexNet architecture that are not so much used anymore. One is that it had this funny layer called local response normalization, which has not really been used to date anymore, so we won't talk about it in detail. But it was a different type of normalization, maybe as a, as a very early precursor to something like batch norm. But nowadays, we prefer to use batch normalization instead. Another piece, uh, another kind of uh, quirky bit about AlexNet is that when, he, when Alex Kochevsky and his collaborators were working on this network back in, 2012, uh, back in 2011 and so, um, gra it was trained on graphics cards, GPUs, and the biggest GPU that they had at the time was a GTX 580, which had only three gigabytes of memory. Um, if you look at maybe the GPUs you guys are using on Colab today, they have something like 12 or 16 gigabytes of memory. Um, so back in 2011, uh, the GPUs available just didn't have very much GPU memory. So in order to get this, this neural network to fit into GPU memory, it was actually distributed across two different uh, physical GTX 580 cards in kind of a complicated scheme where some of the network ran on one card and some of the network ran on another card. Um, and this was kind of an implementation detail that was required in order to fit the G this, this network onto the GPU hardware that was available at that time. Um, this, this, this idea of splitting neural networks across GPUs is still sometimes used today, but in general, uh, it's not a very common thing to see with most of the networks that we'll see in this lecture. 
Um, and, uh, and of course, at the top of the slide here is this very, very uh, famous figure from the AlexNet paper that shows this convolutional neural network design of, the, of, of AlexNet. And you can see that it has these five convolutional layers and it's split into two chunks at the top and the bottom to fit onto the two GPUs that it was distributed against. But one kind of funny thing about this figure is that it looks, it's actually kind of clipped at the top. And if you look at the paper itself, um, even in the AlexNet paper itself, this figure was actually clipped at the top. So um, <laughs> even though this is one of the most, even though this is a very important paper, um, now we're, everyone is stuck looking at this clipped figure because that's the version of the figure that actually was published in the paper. Um, and I'd also like to point out, just as a historic note, AlexNet, I think, is, it's hard to overstate just how influential this paper has been. If you look at the number of citations that this paper has gotten per year since it was published in 2012, um, it's already gotten something like 46,000 citations since 2012. And if you look at this <laughs> citation trend, um, it seems to be still growing exponentially. Um, so this is certainly one of the most highly cited papers, not just in computer science, but I think across all disciplines in all areas of science in the last few years. And to put this into context, I think it's also interesting to compare uh, these citations with some, other famous cita with some other famous scientific papers throughout history. For example, if we look at Darwin's Origin of Species back in 1859, it has something like a, a similar number of citations as Alex Dett does today. Um, or Claude Shannon's A Mathematical Theory of, of, uh, of Communication, which invented the field of information theory, had something like 69,000 like 69, citations, and it was published in 1948. Um, if we look at contemporary research, um, there was another extremely important piece of scientific research published in 2012, which was the, dis the experimental discovery of the Higgs boson particle at the Large Hadron Collider. This was published the same year as um, the AlexNet paper. And this is, a fundamental, this is a fundamentally important advance in basic science, that we observe a new fundamental particle in the universe. And this has only 14,000 citations compared to AlexNet's 46,000. So um, I, I need to caveat here that uh, cita looking at citation counts for papers is really not the, is really kind of a very coarse measure of their impact, and it's really unfair to compare citation counts across time and across different disciplines. But that said, I think it's I think it's pretty clear um, to many people that this AlexNet paper and this AlexNet architecture represents an important advance not just within computer vision or computer si or computer science, but really across all of human knowledge as a whole. Um, hopefully, that's not overstating uh, too much. But with that, um, with that historical context in mind, what actually is, what does the AlexNet architecture actually look like? Well, um, this, so AlexNet starts off with uh, an input image of 227 by 227 pixels and works on RGB images, so it has three input channels. Um, the first convolutional layer has, uh, so this is, uh, by the way, should be a bit of recap from uh, the convolution layer that we talked about in the previous lecture. But the first convolution layer in AlexNet um, has 64 filters, a kernel size of 11 by 11, a stride of four, and a pad of four. So given those settings for this first convolutional layer, what is the number of channels in the output of that first convolutional layer? Yeah, it should be 64, because recall that for a convolution layer, the number of channels is always equal to the number of filters. Then the next question is, what is the, what is the output size? Uh, here in this table, I've collapsed, collapsed height and width into one column because it, everything is square throughout this architecture. Um, anyone want, anyone want, to take, want to take a guess at the, the output spatial size of this first convolution layer? Yeah, 56. Um, so uh, if you remember this formula from the slide uh, on the last lecture, we know that the output size is equal to the input size minus the kernel size plus two times the padding divided by the stride plus one. If you plug in those numbers, you see that we get 56 for the output of this first layer. Um, now, another question, how much memory would this output feature map to consume in kilobytes? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's reasonable to do this multiplication in your head. Um, but the number of elements in that output tensor is going to be C by output size by output size. So the number of elements in that output tensor is something like 200,000. And we typically store these elements in 32-bit floating points. So each element takes four bytes of memory. So multiply that by four and divide out. And you see that this layer takes about, 700, takes about 784 kilobytes of memory to store the output of this layer. Now the next question, how many parameters or how many learnable parameters are in this layer of the network? Well, for this one, we remember the sh what is the shape of a weight for a convolutional layer. And we remember that the shape of the weight for a convolutional layer is a four-dimensional tensor 
of size output channels by input channels by kernel size by kernel size. So output channels is 64, input channels is three, kernel size is 11. Um, plus there's this learnable bias, which is a vector of the same number of channels, uh, with, of the number of output channels. So the total number of learnable weights here is about 23,000. Um, next, how many floating point operations does it take to compute this, this convolution layer? Well, again, I think it's maybe tricky to do this multiplication in your head. But in order to compute this, we, uh, so by the way, this, this idea of floating point operations and counting floating point operations for layers in a neural network will be a very important topic through, throughout today's lecture. Um, so first off, when we talk about floating point operations in a neural network, we usually count the number of multiply adds, where a multiply together with an add counts as one floating point operation for the purpose of counting operations in a neural network. Um, this is because many, many actual bits of computing hardware can perform a floating point multiplication and an accumulation in a single clock cycle. So we tend to count uh, multiply and an add as a single operation. Now to count the number of operations that it costs to perform this convolution layer, we think um, how many output elements are there in the tensor, and that's C out by output size by output size, and how many operations does it take to compute each element of that output tensor? Well, recall that each element of that output tensor is computed by taking the convolutional filter and slapping it inside the, the input dimension some, sometime, somewhere. So each element of the output tensor results, is the result of computing an inner product between a convolutional filter, which has size C in by K by K, and another chunk of the input, which has size C in by K by K. Um, and, and a dot product, taking a dot product of two vectors with n elements takes n multiplies and n adds once you count the bias term. So when you multiply all that out, you see that this first convolutional layer takes something like 73 megaflops um, in order to compute the convolution of this first layer. Um, so now the second layer in AlexNet is a pooling layer immediately following, oh, I mean, this, actually there's, there's, a, there's a ReLU. So I'm sort of omitting the ReLUs from many of the, many of the architectures in this lecture because it's always assumed there'll be some ReLU or some nonlinearity immediately following the convolution layer. Um, so immediately after the ReLU and, and the first convolution, AlexNet has its first pooling layer. And the pooling layer here for Alex, the first pooling layer has a kernel size of three, a stride of two, and a pad of one. So given those parameters, what should the output shape of this first layer in AlexNet be? Well, the number of channel dimensions is the same, because recall that pooling layers operate independently on each input channel, so pooling layers don't change the number of channels. Um, and here, this pooling layer has the effect of downsampling the input spatially by a size, by a factor of two. Um, AlexNet's kind of a funny architecture, and all the numbers don't actually divide evenly in AlexNet, which is a little bit annoying. So here, we have to actually, uh, after, we do, after we divide by the stride, we also have to round down to get the, the output si spatial size of 27 by 27. And again, we can ask how much memory does the output of the pooling layer take? And we see that we, we have the same procedure of four bytes per element multiplied by the number of elements in the tensor gives us the amount of memory usage at this layer. Um, next, how many learnable parameters are in this, this pooling layer? Is zero, because recall, pooling layers have no learnable parameters. They simply take a max over their receptive field. Um, then how many floating point operations does it take to compute this pooling layer? Well, here it's uh, maybe again difficult to do the multiplication in your head, but again, we have this similar way of thinking about um, how, many, uh, how many elements are in the output tensor, which is number of output channels by output size by output size, and how many floating point operations does it take to compute one element in the output tensor? Well, recall that each element in the output tensor is the result of taking a max over the receptive field within one channel. So we have to take the max of um, uh, three by, a three by three grid of elements. So we need to find the maximum of, of nine elements. You can imagine that taking approximately nine floating point operations, maybe eight, but for simplicity, we'll just say that it's equal to the, to the kernel size squared. So if you multiply this out, we see that, the float, that this max pooling layer takes only about, only about 0 0.5, only about 0 0.4 megaflops. Um, which you should notice is very, very small compared to the convolution layer. So this is a, fa a fairly general trend in convolutional neural networks, that the convolution layers tend to have a lot of, tend to cost a lot of compute, tend to take a lot of floating point operations, where the max pooling layers or other types of pooling layers generally cost very little floating point operations. 
Um, so much so that when sometimes people write papers and count the number of operations in a neural network, they'll even not even count the, 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 max, the, the max pooling layers, just because the number of operations there is so small compared to the number of convolution layers. Now, AlexNet has five more convolution layers. Um, I'm not gonna walk through this exact um, procedure for each one of those layers, but we can similarly compute the output size and the number of, of and the, the number of memory and parameters and flops for each one of these five convolution layers in AlexNet. Um, and interspersed with these convolution layers are several more pooling layers. And by the time we finish with all of the convolution layers and all of the pooling layers, AlexNet is uh, left with an output tensor of, with 256 channels and a six by six spatial size. And after all of these convolution layers terminate, then we have this flattening operation that um, flattens out all of the, that, that destroys all the spatial structure in that input tensor and just flattens it out into a vector. So then this flatten layer um, just uh, flattens everything into a vector and it has no, it has, uh, no parameters and no flops. Now after, the flat, after this flattening operation, we have our first fully connected layer with 496 hidden units. Um, again, we can compute the memory, the parameters, and the flops for this, fully connected, for this first fully connected layer. Um, after the first fully connected layer, we've got two more fully connected layers, one more with 496 hidden units, and the final FC8 layer with 1,000 units to produce the 1,000 scores for our 1,000 categories. So this is um, the AlexNet architecture. And the question is, like, how was this designed? The unfortunate reality, I think, behind AlexNet is that the exact configuration of these convolution layers was really a lot of trial and error. Um, so the exact settings of these are somewhat mysterious, um, but it seems to work well in practice. Um, as we'll see moving forward, um, people wanted to try to find principles for designing neural networks that let them scale up and scale down and didn't rely so much on extensive trial and error of explicitly tuning the filter sizes and strides and everything for every individual layer. But for AlexNet, I think the best answer is that these settings are really trial and error. But if we look over at this, at these last three columns and look at the memory, the parameters, and the flops um, marching down through the network, then we start to see some very interesting trends that hold true not just in AlexNet, but also across a lot of different convolutional neural network architectures. Um, here, we've already pointed out one trend that see the, as we mentioned, all of the pooling layers take such little uh, floating point operations that they all round down to zero. So we can, so we can effectively discount the, floating po the, the pooling layers when trying to count the number of operations in a neural network. And here, we can, uh, re we can redraw that exact same data um, of the, number of mem the amount of memory, the number of parameters, and the number of flops for each layer of this network and convert it into some bar charts. So here, we see a couple of very interesting trends. Um, so here, if we look at the, at the chart on the left, this shows the amount of memory that is used but at the outputs of the first, com the first five, the five convolutional layers and at the outputs of the three fully connected layers. And here, we see this very clear trend that the, ma the vast majority of the memory usage in AlexNet actually comes from storing the activations at the early convolutional layers. Um, this happens because at those early convolutional layers, we, the outputs are, have a relatively high spatial resolution and a relatively high number of filters. So when you multiply that out, it, it happens that most of the memory usage happens in the very first couple of layers of the network. Now, if we look at the middle plot, this shows the number of parameters in each layer. And this shows the opposite trend with, from compute. This shows that for the convolutional layers have very, very few parameters, um, whereas the fully connected layers actually take a, a very, very large number of parameters. And the, the layer with the single largest number of parameters is that very first fully connected layer that happens after the flattening operation. Because um, what, if, you look, if you think about what happens in an FC6 layer, we had this spatial tensor of six by six by, what was it, uh, six by six by 256, and that gets fully connected into 4,096 4, hidden dimensions. So the weight matrix is now um, six times six times 256 times 4,096. So that one weight matrix of FC6 has something like uh, 37 million, has almost 38 million parameters in just that one fully connected layer of the neural network. Um, and in fact, basically all of the learnable parameters in AlexNet come from these fully connected layers. Um, whereas if you look at the amount of computation that each layer costs, then you see yet another trend, which is that the fully connected layers take very little computation because they're just multiplying a very large matrix. Whereas the vast majority of the computation in this neural network comes from all of the convolutional layers 
and especially layers that take a lot of computation are layers that have convolutions with large numbers of filters at high spatial resolutions. Um, and this is quite a general trend across many different neural network designs, not just AlexNet, that you can, you'll, you'll have most of the memory usage in the early convolutional layers, most of the parameters in the fully connected layers, and most of the computation in the convolutional layers. Um, so these trends are kind of interesting to keep in mind as we move on to later architectures that try to address more efficient architectures that try to um, fix some of these trends. So that, that's our brief overview of the AlexNet architecture. So that, that's what happened in 2012. What happened in 2013? Well, in 2013, um, pretty much all of the entrants to this competition now switched over to using neural networks. And the winner of the competition was also an eight-layer network um, called ZFNet, after the authors, uh, Matt Zeiler and Rob Fergus. Um, ZFNet is basically a bigger AlexNet. I told you that AlexNet was uh, essentially produced via trial and error. Well, ZFNet is more trial and less error. Um, so basically, in ZFNet, it's the same basic idea as AlexNet, except they've tweaked some of the layer configurations. In particular, in the first convolutional layer, AlexNet had 11 by 11 stride 4. Turns out it's, it works better if you use 7 by 7 stride 2. Who'd have thunk? Um, and for those later convolutional layers, in convolutional layers 3, 4, and 5, um, instead of using 384, 384, 256 filters like in AlexNet, instead we increase the number of filters and use 512, 1024, 512. And who knows, this also tends to work better. Um, so to be a little bit less facetious, um, the I think the, the takeaway from ZFNet is that it makes, it's just a bigger version of AlexNet. So if you look at the first convolutional layer, if we, when we change from stride four to stride two, that means that we are aggre less aggressively downsampling the input in space at the very first layer. So that um, this 11 by 11 stride four in AlexNet will immediately spatial do spatially downsample by a factor of four, whereas for ZFNet, that first convolutional layer will only downsample by a factor of two, which means that all the other feature maps moving throughout the ZFNet will now have a, a higher spatial resolution. And higher spatial resolution means more receptive fields, means more compute. So uh, the ZFNet actually is going to cost a lot more computation than AlexNet. And for the later convolutional layers, by increasing the number of filters, um, this also just makes the network bigger. It has more learnable parameters, it takes more memory, it takes more compute. So I think the, the takeaway from AlexNet to ZFNet is that bigger networks tend to work better. Um, but at this point in time, there was not really a principled mechanism for making the networks bigger or smaller at will. Um, instead, they kind of had to reach into the individual layers and tune some of the individual parameters one at a time in order to make the networks bigger. Um, but in doing so, they were able to achieve a fairly large increase in performance over AlexNet. Um, and we saw the error rate on this ImageNet challenge drop from 16.4 down to 11.7 with ZFNet. Now, 2014 was when things started to get very, very interesting. And 2014 brought around the, the so-called VGG architecture, um, from Karen Simonian and uh, Andrew Zisserman. Now, VGG was really one of the first architectures to have a principled design throughout. So we saw that AlexNet and ZFNet were designed in somewhat of an ad hoc way, that there was some number of convolution layers, there was some number of pooling layers, but the exact configurations of each layer were set independently by hand through trial and error. And this makes it very hard to scale networks up or down. So instead, as we moved into, uh, now starting in 2014, people started to move away from these hand-designed, bespoke convolutional architectures, and instead wanted to move to architectures that had some design principles that were used to guide the overall configuration of the network. And the VGG networks were particularly, had, had just followed a couple very, very clean and simple design principles. The design principles of VGG were that all convolution layers are going to be three by three stride two. All pooling layers are going to be max pooling layers, two by two stride two. Um, and every time after a max pooling layer, you're going to, we're going to double the number of channels. And um, then we're going to have some number of convolution layers and eventually some fully connected layers. And the number of hidden units in the fully connected layers were the same as AlexNet. So these, with these simple design rules, it lets you design, it lets you not have to think so hard about the exact configuration of each layer in your neural network. But let's think about, uh, so, it, and also this, this network had uh, five convolutional stages. Remember that AlexNet had five convolutional layers. Now, VGG pushed that forward and moved to deeper networks, 
where now rather than five individual convolutional layers, we have five stages, where each stage consists of a couple of convolution layers uh, and a pooling layer. So the, the VGG architecture is like com com pool, com com pool, com com pool, um, and for however many, sta however, I mean, however many stages you're going to have. Um, they, they, there were ex um, several different VGG architectures that were tested, but the ones that were most popular were the 16 layer and the 19 layer VGG architectures, um, so which had uh, always two convolutional layers in the first three <coughs> stages and either three or four convolutional layers in the last two stages. Um, so that's pretty much all you need to know in order to know how to build a VGG network. But it's useful to think about why people chose these particular design principles for um, designing the network in this way. Well, first, let's think about why it makes sense to have only three by three convolutions in your network. So you saw in AlexNet and in ZFNet that this number of the, the, the size of the convolutional kernel in each layer was a hyperparameter, and people played around with different convolutional kernel sizes at different layers. Well, um, let's, con let's, con let's think about two different options that we could have as alternatives. Um, for, as one alternative, we could imagine a, a convolutional layer with five by five kernels that takes uh, C, C channels of input and produces C channels of output um, that operates on uh, an input of size H by W. And here we can assume that we have a padding of two and stride of one so that the output size is the same spatial size as the input. Well, this, this convolutional layer would have a number of parameters. The number of parameters is 25 C squared um, because we each, we've got a, a C convolutional filters. Each one has a five by five by C, so it's 25 C squared learnable parameters in this layer, ignoring the bias. And the number of floating point operations that it costs to compute this convolutional layer is now 25 C squared HW because the number of outputs uh, from the layer is going to be h by w by c, and the cost of, of computing every one of those outputs will be five by five by c. So the overall cost of the layer is 25 c squared hw. Now let's contrast this with a stack of two convolutional layers uh, that each have kernel size three by three, um, that also produce input, that take c channels as input and produce c channels as output. Well, as we remember from our discussion of receptive fields in the previous lecture, we know that if we stack up two three by three convolutions, then it has an effective receptive field size of five by five. So in terms of how much of the input can we see after these number of layers, in terms of receptive fields, this five by five convolutional layer and this pair of three by three convolutional layers is somehow equivalent in terms of the amount of the input that they're able to see. Um, but, uh, but if we compute the number of parameters for these things, we see that each of these two convolutional layers, the number of parameters is 9c squared. So the total number of parameters for the, for the stack of two comp, three by three comp is 18c squared. And similarly, the, the number of floating point operations for this stack of two convolutional layers is only 18c squared hw. Because again, the output is chw, and the cost of computing any one of those outputs is three by three by c. So each output costs 9c, and you multiply it all out, we've got two layers. So the overall cost of the stack of two three by three comp is 18 C squared HW. And now we see something interesting, is that even though these two layers have the same receptive field size, the stack of two three by three convolutions has fewer learnable parameters and, and costs less computation. So the insight from the VGG network is that, well, maybe there's no reason to have larger filter sizes at all. Because any time you wanted to have a five by five filter, you could have instead replaced with two by three by three filters. And by a similar argument, rather than a single seven by seven filter, you could have replaced with a stack of three by of three three by three convolution layers. So with that in mind, it lets us sort of throw away the kernel size as a hyperparameter. And the only thing we need to worry about is how many of these three by three conv layers are we going to stack within each stage. Um, and uh, right. So then the, turning to the second design, oh right, the other piece about this is that if we stack two three by three convolutional layers after one another, we can actually insert ReLUs in between those two convolutional layers, which actually provides us more depth and more nonlinear computation compared to a single five by five um, convolution. So not only is the, th is the stack of two three by three convolutions has fewer parameters, it has fewer plot flops, and it allows more nonlinear computation. So it just seems like a clear win over a single five by five convolutional layer. So that's the idea behind this first design rule in VGG. So then let's think about the second design rule in VGG, 
um, it's, it says that all of, our, all of our pooling layers are going to be two by two max pooling stride two, pad zero, which means that every pooling layer is going to have the spatial resolution of the input feature map. And the other, the other rule here is that every time after we pool, we will double the number of channels. So then let's think about what happens between two stages um, when we follow these rules. So for, let's think about the computation at stage one, for instance. Um, the, then one of our layers inside stage one would have an input of size C by 2H by 2H, um, and the layer would be a three by three convolution with C input channels and C output channels. If you multiply all this out, we see that the amount of memory consumed by this output tensor is going to be 4HWC. It's the number of elements in the output tensor after this convolution. The number of param learnable parameters is 9C squared, excluding the bias. And the number of floating point operations is 4HWC squared, using a, uh, um, right. Actually, that's, that, that doesn't seem right. I think that's an error. But the, it's okay, the same error is propagated over here, so the argument still holds. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, they're both off by the same constant. Um, I'll fix this after, after the lecture. Now, after we go to the second, uh, after we move to the next stage, then the number of channels would be doubled and the number of spatial resolution would be halved. Well, when this happens, we can see that the memory um, is reduced by a factor of two and the number of parameters um, increases by a factor of four, but the number of floating point operations stays the same. Now, here's the error, is that these two number of floating point operations, I think, are both off by a factor of nine, but since they're both off by a factor of nine, it's still true that they both, these, these two layers in two uh, subsequent stages still cost the same number of floating point operations. So this design principle has actually followed along, it's been followed by many, many, many convolutional architectures following VGG. The basic idea is that we want to preserve this, we want each convolutional layer to cost the same amount of floating point operations. And we can do that by having the spatial size and doubling the number of channels um, at the end of each convolutional stage. So then, um, another thing to point out is that we can compare AlexNet and VGG16 head by head, uh, side to side. Remember that AlexNet had um, five convolutional layers and three fully connected layers. And now all of the, VG, the VGG networks also have five convolutional stages um, and three fully connected layers. And now we can draw this same plot of memory, parameters, and, uh, and floating point operations to compare at a, at, a, at a stage by stage basis between AlexNet and VGG. And here the overwhelming uh, result from these graphs is that VGG is just a gigantic network compared to AlexNet. If we look at the number of members, like can you even see these blue bars on these, on these graphs? Um, like Ale uh, VGG is just dwarfing AlexNet on all of these different axes of computation. It takes dramatically more memory. If you look at the total amount of memory consumed by storing the activations for all of these outputs, then VGG is something like 25 times greater. If you look at the total number of learnable parameters, AlexNet had about 61 million. VGG16 has 138 million, so more than twice as many learnable parameters. And the real killer is the amount of computation that these two things cost. If you, if you add up the total number of floating point operations that cost that it, it, that it takes to compute a single forward pass to AlexNet versus a single forward pass in VGG, we see that VGG is more than 19 times more expensive in terms of floating point operations. So VGG16 is just this absolutely massive network. And again, we still get this story um, that we saw moving from AlexNet to ZF, is that bigger networks tend to achieve better results on this large scale image net challenge. But now with VGG, it gives us a guiding principle, a couple of guiding design principles that let us easily scale up or scale down the network. Um, and we no longer have to go in and fiddle with the individual hyperparameters of every layer. Now, 2014 was such an interesting layer, uh, such an interesting year that there's actually two convolutional neural network architectures that came out of that year's challenge that we need to talk about. Um, one was VGG. Oh, I, I should point out another very amazing thing about this VGG architecture is that it was done in academia by one grad student and one faculty member. Um, so at, at that, that was quite a heroic effort on their part. Um, the other network that we need to talk about from 2015, from 2014, was from Google. This was a very large team with access to a very large amount of computation. Um, so I think it was quite a testament to the, the, the VGG team in 2014 that even though they didn't win the ImageNet classification challenge that year, they really held their own against this, this, uh, this corporate team with access to many more resources. Um, now the main takeaway of GoogleNet 
is that, uh, so because they wanted to be cute, remember there was this, uh, oh, sorry, was there a question? Yeah, the question was, was VGG also split across multiple GPUs? Well, from v starting around that time, well, I think we'll talk about this more later, but there it was, it was split across multiple GPUs, but it was, uh, it, was a, it was data parallelism. So they basically take the batch of data, you split the batch and compute different elements of the batch on different GPUs. So each, so you no longer split the model across GPUs, instead you split your mini batch across GPUs. So that required, that's, that's much simpler to implement compared to the model parallelism that was used in AlexNet. Uh, yeah, question? Uh, that's a great question. So, VG, uh, so VGG stands for the Visual Geometry Group, which is the name of the academic lab that this network came out of. Um, so it's, uh, I guess the, the name of the lab is now intrinsically linked to this particular convolutional neural network design. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. Um, but that's what, the, that's what it stands for. Um, so it, the, other, the other architecture we need to talk about from 2014 is GoogleNet. Um, it's a cute name. Remember that there was one of the earliest convolutional neural network architectures was Lynette that was created by Jan LeCun. Um, and now in homage to Lynette and Jan LeCun, this Google team decided to name their network GoogleNet. It's very cute. And the idea, the, the overwhelming idea behind GoogleNet was to focus on efficiency. Um, if you look at the trend from AlexNet to ZF to VGG, the trend that we can see is that bigger networks perform better. But with GoogleNet, the, the team was really focused on trying to design efficient convolutional neural network um, because Google actually wants to run these things for real in data centers and on mobile phones. So they save a lot of money if they can get the same performance with a cheaper convolutional network design. So they were really focused on trying to build a network that worked really, really well, while also minimizing the overall complexity of the network. So they had a couple innovations that were really started out, or made popular by the GoogleNet architecture that were carried forward to a lot of other following neural network architectures. One is the use of a stem network at the very, at the very first couple of convolutional layers, which very aggressively downsamples the input image and very, uh, in order to aggressively downsample the spatial resolution of the input very quickly. Um, because as you'll recall, with VGG or AlexNet, the very expensive layers were those um, big convolutions on, on uh, feature maps of very large spatial size. So to, so to avoid those expensive convolutions on large spatial feature maps, they use a lightweight stem that quickly downsamples the, the input. So I'm not gonna walk through the stem design in, in, uh, in detail, but you can see that it very quickly downsamples from the input resolution, spatial resolution of 224 by 224 all the way down to 28 by 28 um, using uh, only a couple layers um, that really, so that you can spend the bulk of computation now operating at this lower spatial resolution and you no longer have to do expensive com com convolutions at a high spatial resolution. Um, so here we can actually compare to VGG16. So if you look at the, the component of GoogleNet that downsamples from 224 down to 28 in spatial resolution, that entire part of the network costs about um, 418 megaflops for GoogleNet. If you look at the equivalent spatial downsampling in VGG16 that goes from 224 down to 228, you can see that that same amount of spatial downsampling in VGG16 costs more than seven gigaflops. Um, so that, that same amount of spatial downsampling was nearly 18 times as expensive if you look at um, GoogleNet against VGG. The other innovation in GoogleNet is this so-called inception module. Um, they were very clever because they gotta go deeper, so they called it inception. Um, yeah, I don't know. But the idea is that they had this little module that they called inception um, that, had, uh, that, that was this local structure that was repeated throughout the entire network. We saw just as VGG used this simple repeated structure of comp comp pool, now GoogleNet used this little inception module design that was repeated throughout the entire, throughout the entire network many times. Um, the inception architecture, it, it, this inception module is kind of funny. Um, it, it also introduced this idea of um, parallel branches of computation. So um, you're, in VG, remember that the kernel size, the convolutional kernel size is always a hyperparameter that we want to try to avoid. In VGG, they took the approach of, replace, you know, we, it turns out that we can replace kernels of any, any, any convolutional size with a stack of three by three and it's kind of equivalent. Well, GoogleNet took a different approach and they said that in order to eliminate the kernel size as a hyperparameter, we're just gonna do all the kernel sizes all the time. So they, in, inside this inception module, they had four parallel branches, one that does a one by one convolution, 
one that does a three by three convolution, one that does a five by five convolution, and one that does a, a, a max pooling with a stride of one. So within every one of these layers, it does all the things. So there's no need to tune hyper kernel size as a hyperparameter because you've got all the kernel sizes in all the places. Um, and the other bit of innovation in the inception module was the use of one by one convolutions before expensive spatial convolutions that was used to reduce the number of channels before doing these, these expensive spatial convolutions. Um, and we'll, we'll revisit this idea of um, convolution, one by one convolutional bottlenecks when we talk about residual networks in a few minutes. So I don't want to talk about that in detail here. Um, the other innovation in GoogleNet is the use of global average pooling at the very end of the network. If you remember back to BGG and AlexNet, we saw that the vast majority of the parameters in BGG and AlexNet were coming from these giant fully connected layers at the very end of the network. Well, in, because one of the ways that we might focus on efficiency is by reducing the number of parameters in the network. So in order to do that, GoogleNet simply eliminates those large fully connected layers. So rem remember in AlexNet and BGG, at the end of the network, at the end of the convolution layers, we had this flatten operation that uh, destroyed spatial information by flattening the convolutional <coughs> tensor into a giant vector. Well, GoogleNet uses a different strategy for destroying spatial information. Rather than flattening the tensor, instead they use an average pooling with a kernel size equal to the final spatial size of the last convolutional layer. So in, in particular, um, the last convolution, at the, at the end of this last inception module in GoogleNet, the, the output tensor is, has a spatial size of seven by seven with 1024 convolutional, uh, with 1024 feature maps. Now, um, then they apply uh, an average pooling with kernel size equal to seven by seven, um, and the stride doesn't matter because it only fits in one place. So what that means is within every of those 1024 channels, they average out, they take the average of the, 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 the values of those channels across all the spatial positions in the input tensor. Um, this, now redu so this, this now also destroys spatial information, but rather than flattening into a giant tensor, instead it actually reduces the total number of elements. So it ends up with this compact vector with only 1024 uh, elements. So then there's only one fully connected layer in GoogleNet, which then goes from this 1024 output from global average pooling that then converts to uh, the 1,000, that goes from 1024 into 1,000, where again, 1,000 is the number of categories in the ImageNet uh, data set. So um, GoogleNet is able to eliminate a huge number of learnable parameters by simply eliminating this fully connected layers and instead replacing them with this idea of global average pooling. And this is something that got picked up by a lot of different convolutional neural networks um, following uh, GoogleNet. Um, we can also compare this side by side with VGG and just see um, how profoundly this affects the number of parameters in the last couple of layers. Another piece of awkwardness in GoogleNet is that they had to rely on this idea of auxiliary classifiers. So one should point, I need to point out that in GoogleNet actually occurred before batch normalization. So before the discovery of batch normalization, it was very, very difficult to train networks that had more than about 10 layers or so. And whenever people tried, wanted to train deeper networks than about 10 layers without batch normalization, they had to resort to some ugly hacks. And one of the ugly hacks that was used in GoogleNet is this idea of auxiliary classifiers. Um, so here, what they did is they attack, you know, at the end of the GoogleNet, they had a global average pooling and a fully connected layer that produced class scores. Well, they had auxiliary global average pooling and fully connected layers at several, at several internal points in the network. So this thing was actually outputting three different sets of class scores, one from the end of the network and, one, and two from these intermediate parts of the network. And then for these intermediate classifiers, they also compute loss and propagate gradients coming back through all three of these classifiers. And this had the effect of making gradients propagate more, more uh, easily through the network. Because um, they, now they're in, if you think about what happens in the backward pass, they inject gradient at the very top of the network, at the, at the final classifier, and they also inject gradient directly in these, uh, according to these um, two auxiliary classifiers. And this was a trick that they used in order to get things to converge, um, in order to get deep networks to converge at that time. Yeah. So yeah, that was very astute. The question is that I said that network, before batch normalization, training networks of more than 10 layers was very tricky and people had to hack it. And VG, you're right, VGG also hacked it in some way. What they did is that they trained a shallow VGG network, um, something like the 11 layer variant of VGG, and then they first trained that to convergence, and then they inserted new layers in between the already trained layers of the 11 layer VGG, and then continued training from that point. 
Um, although you can imagine that there's some definite tricks in optimization that are needed in order to get things to converge after you stick in new layers in the middle of an already trained network. So that was a bit of hairiness in VGG that they had to use in order to get their networks to converge. Um, so you can see that 2014 was kind of a dark time for neural network practitioners. Um, you had to resort to all these crazy hacks to get your networks to converge once they got beyond a certain depth. Thankfully, things changed in 2015. So, uh, by, so actually, one of the important things that between 2014 and 2015 is when batch normalization was discovered. So once batch normalization was discovered, um, people found that they were able to train VGG and train GoogleNet from scratch without any of these tricks by just using batch normalization instead. Um, but then there was an extremely important innovation in neural network architecture design that happened in the 2015 iteration of the ImageNet challenge. And those were called residual networks or ResNets. And here you can see something amazing happen. The number of layers jumped in one year from 22 all the way up to 152. So people, uh, so this was a very important innovation in the history of neural network architecture design. Um, you can also see that the error dropped dramatically again from 6.7 and almost halved down to 3.6. Um, so ResNets were, were kind of the, uh, a very important moment in neural network architecture design. So as we mentioned, once, once batch normalization had been discovered, people realized that they were able to train networks that were fairly deep um, with even with dozens of layers. So then the question is, what happens if we just keep stacking layers and stacking layers and train, try to train very, very deep networks? Well, here is kind of a cartoon picture of the types of plots people saw at that time. Um, here is the training curve where um, the x-axis is the number of training iterations and the y-axis is the test error. And we're comparing a 56 layer model and a 20 layer model. And here something very strange happens. We see that the 56 layer model actually performs worse than the 20 layer model. And this is surprising because the previous trend that we had talked about was that bigger neural networks tended to work better up to this point in time. So it was very surprising to all of a sudden see the bigger, deeper networks now performing worse once you got past a certain point. So the initial guess of what was going on is that maybe these networks had started overfitting. That you can imagine, maybe once, once you got to a 56 layer network and you had batch normalization, maybe this was just such a large network that it was now overfitting this ImageNet training set. But we, in order to test this hypothesis, we can look at the training performance of these same networks. And if you look at the training, the performance on the training set of these same 20 layer and 56 layer networks, you see that the network was not overfitting. That in fact, this 56 layer network was somehow underfitting the training set. That somehow there's a problem in optimization. That somehow this deeper model, even once we have batch normalization, once you get to a certain depth, um, we're no longer able to efficiently optimize very deep networks. This is a problem. And this is also surprising because we should expect that a deeper model should have the capacity to emulate a shallower model. What do I mean by that? Um, so you could imagine that a 56 layer network could emulate a 20 layer network because we could imagine taking the 20 layer network, copying all of its layers into the 56 layer network and have all of the other remaining layers just learn the identity function. So in principle, if our optimizers were working properly, then the, the deeper the network goes, the deeper network should always have the capacity to represent the same functions as the shallower networks. So if we are actually underfitting, then it means that we have an optimization problem. That somehow these deeper networks are not able to efficiently learn these identity functions in order to, uh, op in order to emulate shallower networks. So the solution is to change the design of the network to make it easier for it to learn identity functions on unused layers. And this should make it easier for deeper networks to learn to emulate shallower networks in case they had too many layers, more layers than they actually needed. So here is the, is the design change that was proposed by residual networks. So previously on the left, here we have the kind of plain convolutional block that we had seen in VGG. That is a stack of two consecutive convolutional layers, um, maybe with a ReLU in between, maybe some batch normalization in between as well. Now residual networks proposed the, this residual block design on the right, which um, still has a stack of two convolutional layers, but now, rather than, now at the end, um, we take our input x and actually add it to the output of the second convolutional layer. This means that the overall block computes this function f of x plus x, where f of x is the output from the, this, basic in, this basic block 
inside of the, or the, 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 residual, the, the residual additive shortcut. Um, and what this means is that this, the idea behind this is that um, this layer can now very easily learn the identity function. If we set the weights of those two convolutional layers to zero, then this, this block should compute the identity. And now this should make it easier for deep networks to emulate shallower networks. This should also help improve the gradient flow of very deep networks. Because you remember that, um, if you remember in what happens in the backward pass of an add gate, um, as we backpropagate through an add, it copies the gradients to both of the inputs. So you can imagine that now when we backpropagate through this residual block, it actually copies the gradients uh, it shortcuts the gradients through those convolutions. And this, again, helps to improve the propagation of gradient information throughout these very, very deep networks. So then, a residual network is a stack of residual blocks. Um, residual networks were sort of inspired by the best parts of VGG and Google Net, in my opinion. So they, they combined this idea of simple design principles from VGG with a couple of these innovations from Google Nets. Um, so this network, much like BGG, this network was divided into stages. Um, within each sta between each stage, we are going to have the spatial resolution and double the number of channels, just like BGG. And all of our convolutions inside these stages will be three, uh, three by three convolutions, just like in BGG. Um, but each of these blocks will now be these residual shortcut blocks. Um, residual networks also take some innovations from GoogleNet. They use, they, like GoogleNet, they also use this aggressive stem in the first couple layers that aggressively downsamples the input. Um, and residual networks also took this idea of global average pooling from, from GoogleNet that, again, eliminates the fully connected layers and reduces the total number of parameters in the network. So, um, so, so then, with these simple patterns, the only thing you need to choose is the initial width of the network, which was 64 in all their experiments, and the number of blocks per stage. So this gives us the ResNet 18, which has two residual blocks per stage, um, which means four convolutions per stage. Four times four is 16 convolutions. There's a convolution in the stem. There's a linear at the end. So if you add that together, that's 18 layers with learnable weights. Yeah. Uh, the question is, what do we mean by downsampling? Um, in this context, we mean any operation that reduces the spatial extent of the image. Um, so that could be strided convolution. That could be max pooling. That could be average pooling. Um, taking every other pixel is not used, I, I don't think that's, I've ever seen that used in a neural network context, but it's differentiable, you could try it. I don't recommend it. Yeah, so in this context, it means any operation that reduces the spatial size of the input. Okay. Um, so what's interesting about this ResNet is that now they become very efficient. So um, uh, now we're able to achieve very low uh, errors on ImageNet with very few amount of floating point operations. Um, there's also a 34 layer version of, of ResNet, which just adds more blocks to some of the stages, but otherwise the design is exactly the same. Um, and again, we can compare this to VGG, which had uh, now something like 13 gigaflops for the whole network and got errors of about 9.6, um, whereas the ResNet 34 got, uh, was only 3.6 gigaflops and actually had lower errors on ImageNet. And a lot of these gains in efficiency were due to these, uh, this aggressive downsampling at the beginning and this uh, global average pooling at the end. So, so there's, as we go to deeper residual networks, they actually modified the block design. So here on the left is the so-called basic block that is used in residual networks. Um, this has two, the, this basic block has a three by three convolution, um, and then another three by three convolution, and ReLUs and batch norms in between them, and uh, this residual shortcut around the three by three convolutions. Well, then we can compute the amount of total floating point operations for this block, again, only counting the convolutional layers. Um, and we see that each of these convolutional layers has costs nine HWC squared, so the total computational cost of this thing is 18 HWC squared. Now, in, for deeper residual networks, they introduced an alternative block design called a bottleneck, bottleneck block. So here, in the, bottle, the bottleneck block now consists of three convolutional layers. The first is, a, a, so it accepts an, in, an input tensor with four times as many spatial channels as uh, the basic block. The first layer is a one by one convolution that acts to reduce the number of channels that are, that, are, that are contained in the tensor. So the first one by one convolution reduces the number of channels from 4C down to C. And then once we reduce the number of channels, then we perform this three by three convolution. And then we have another one by one convolution that expands the number of channels again, increasing the number of channels from C up to 4C again. So now, if we now we can use the same procedure to compute the computational cost of the bottleneck design, block design. And we can see that each of these bottleneck, these one by one bottleneck and unbottleneck convolutions, 
each cost for HWC squared. Um, and this middle convolutional layer has the same cost of nine HWC squared. So actually the overall cost of this bottleneck design is 17 HWC squared, which is slightly less than, this than, the, than the computational cost of this bottleneck residual block. Um, but at, so this means that we get uh, less computation, but again, more nonlinearity and more sequential computation. Um, and somehow the, the intuition is that deeper layers should be able to, deeper layers with more nonlinearity should be able to perform more complex types of computation. So by switching from this basic block to this uh, bottleneck block, it lets us build networks that are deeper while not, it, while not increasing the computational cost. Um, so then, so far, we've seen the 18 layer and the 34 layer residual networks that use this basic block. Then, if we simply take the 34 layer ResNet and replace all of the basic blocks with residual block, with, the, with bottleneck blocks, now this increases the total number of layers in the network from 34 to 50, but does not really change the overall computational cost of the network. And now, by making this change that increases the number of layers without increasing the computation, you can see that the, the, the error on ImageNet actually decreases. Um, so that by simply making it deeper, without increasing computation, we're able to decrease the error on ImageNet from 5.85 down to 7.13, which is actually a fairly large reduction in error, given that these two networks actually have similar computational cost. Now, this residual networks, um, we can actually go deeper than that, um, and we can define 101 layer and 152 layer versions of residual networks that have the same basic design. They use bottleneck blocks. They just use more bottleneck blocks per stage. And you can see the clear trend with residual networks is that as you stack these layers to go deeper and deeper, the networks tend to work better and better. So this was a big deal in 2015. So in previous competitions, there's always a bunch of computer vision competitions every year, and usually one team will win one competition, another team will win another competition. But in 2015, ResNets crushed everything. They won every track in the ImageNet competition. That's the classification challenge, the localization challenge, which we have not talked about, and the detection challenge, which we have not talked about. There was also a concurrent set of challenges run by, uh, around a different data set called Microsoft COCO. Um, the same team that built residual networks also swept every challenge in COCO, winning the detection challenge and the semantic segmentation challenge in the COCO data set as well. Um, and their, the main thing that they did is took existing methods for all these different tasks and just swap in their 152 layer residual network. And in doing so, they just crushed everyone that year. So this was a very big deal. It got everyone to wake up and pay attention. And from that time forward, residual networks became a, a, a baseline that is a really widely used, even still to this day, for a wide variety of, of different tasks in computer vision. So there was a follow-up paper in residual networks that played a little bit with the exact organization of batch norm, the exact order of convolution, batch norm, and ReLU. Um, and they found that by shuffling the orders of these things, you could get it to work a little bit better, um, so which was kind of interesting to see, um, that I think uh, is maybe useful if you're trying to squeeze out that little last percentage of performance from your residual networks. Now, as kind of a summary of where we've gotten to today, um, you can see this comparison of computational complexity. So here on the right is this very nice plot where on the x-axis, so each dot here is a different neural network architecture. The x-axis is the number of floating point operations that it takes to compute a forward pass of that architecture. The y-axis is the accuracy on the ImageNet challenge. And the size of the dot is the number of learnable parameters. Um, so this is a really nice visualization that packs a lot of lessons that we've seen into one nice diagram. So here you can see that oh, Google has been going on. They have Inception versions 2, 3, and 4, and Inception version 4 plus ResNet. We haven't talked about the, I don't want to talk about the details of those. But here you can see from this plot is that VGG um, has very high memory, takes a ton of computations, um, and is just kind of an inefficient network design overall. Um, GoogleNet is this very small, very efficient, but not quite as high performing as some of the later, the later networks. AlexNet down here in the corner is, um, is very low in compute, lower than any of the other variants that we see here, um, but it still has quite a lot of parameters due to the large fully connected layers. And we can see that residual networks give us this uh, fairly simple design, moderate efficiency, but able to give us high accuracy as we scale to deeper and deeper residual networks. So then, um, moving forward, what happened in 2016? Nothing much that was very exciting. Uh, the winner in 2016 was model ensembling. Um, I don't know if you've ever done like Kaggle challenges or whatever, but basically they took all the winning neural network architectures in the last couple of years, ensembled them together, and did slightly better. 
So that was not very exciting. But there were a couple attempts to moving forward to improve residual networks. So recall that we've seen this bottleneck residual block that was the building block of the 152 layer residual networks. Well, um, if one bottleneck branch is good, then why not have multiple bottleneck branches in parallel? Um, and that was the idea behind Res Next, which was supposed to be the next generation of residual networks. So here the idea is that we will have our basic building block for the, the Res Next network will have uh, G parallel pathways, and each parallel pathway will itself be a little bottleneck block. But now the inner channel dimension of, that, of these parallel bottleneck blocks will be a new constant called little c. So now we can compute the total flops of this, uh, of, oh, and then at the end, after we compute the output from these different parallel pathways, these parallel bottleneck blocks, the outputs will all be added together. And now we can compute the total computational cost of this, uh, of this strange multi-pathway design, and you can see that each of these individual uh, bottleneck, each of these individual branches has a computational cost of eight big C little c plus nine little c squared, which you can kind of multiply out and see the pattern here. And now what's interesting is that we can actually uh, set up a quadratic equation and, find, and once we set the channel dimension C and the number of parallel pathways G, then we can set up a quadratic equation and solve for little c such that this uh, parallel, this, this multi-path architecture with G parallel branches will have the same computational cost as this original bottleneck design. So then it turns out that if you kind of solve these things, um, they, the integer, they don't work out exactly, but if you kind of round to the nearest integer, then if we have, for example, 64 channels and four parallel pathways, um, then we can set little c to be 24 channels on each of those parallel pathways, and it's the same computational cost. Or if we have um, maybe 32 parallel pathways, then we can have each of those pathways have little c equals four channels. So this basically gives us another mechanism that lets us modify the design of our network. Now, in addition to setting the number of channels, we can also set the number of parallel pathways. And by um, solving the equation in this way, we can set the number of parallel pathways in a way that also preserves the amount of computation that's being done. Um, and it turns out that there's an, op there's a, there's an operation in, pi in uh, convolution called grouped convolution that lets us implement this equivalent, this, this idea of parallel pathways using uh, this idea of grouped convolution that I don't have time to talk about the specifics here. Um, but the idea is that now we've modified our, our design to effectively have these multiple parallel pathways that gives us another axis on which we can modify our network. So then what the, in this res next design, this res next architecture, you see that um, we can, as, as we keep the same computational cost, but increase the number of parallel pathways within each block, actually that leads to an increase in performance. So even though, the, so then we can have, a, we can start with a baseline 50 layer ResNet model and then increase the number of parallel pathways and as we do so, the, the accuracy actually increases. And the same trend holds for the 101 layer ResNet that we can increase the number of pathways and get improved performance even while maintaining the same computational complexity for the network. So then what happened in 2017? Um, people built on top of this idea of ResNext and added another little bell and whistle called squeeze and excitation that made things work a little bit better. Um, and 2017 was the end of the road. Um, after 2017, people decided that um, the juice had been squeezed out of the ImageNet data set and the challenge was shutting down. Um, so it will live on on Kaggle as a Kaggle challenge, but, it's no, but there was kind of an end of, the er end of an era when the ImageNet challenge ended in 2017. But uh, design, but even though the ImageNet challenge ended, people have still been going nuts trying to design ever bigger and more interesting neural network architectures. So a couple you might want to be aware of. Um, one is this so-called, and, and by the way, a lot of these lessons um, sort of carried on to further neural network architectures. This idea of aggressive downsampling, of trading of trying to maintain computation, of trying to build networks that were efficient and, and performing well while maintaining or reducing computation. This idea of having repeated block structures throughout the network that could be repeated in order to design your networks without having to tune every layer. All of these design parameters and design ideals were carried forward into later neural network designs. One that you might see floating out there in the wild sometimes is this densely connected neural network. The idea here is that um, just like, it, it's, a different, it's sort of a different way of doing shortcut connections or skip connections. So as we saw in residual networks, we were able to propagate gradients better by having this additive shortcut connection 
Well, dense ne these densely connected neural networks instead use a concatenation shortcut. So rather than adding previous features to later features, instead they concatenate <coughs> previous features with later features in order to reuse the same features at different parts in the network. And again, they repeat this little dense block at multiple stages throughout the network. Then another trend that became very um, important in the last couple of years has been that, so, so far we've kind of been operating in this high parameter regime of people trying to just get, trying to max out the accuracy on ImageNet while also minimizing the, 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 the flops. Um, but, the over, but the overarching design was always to get high accuracy. Now, kind of happening in parallel was this idea of, you know, maybe it's okay to trade off some accuracy in some contexts. And maybe what we want to do is try to get the absolute tiniest network possible that still performs okay, um, but has very, very minimal computation, such that you can run it on mobile devices or run it in embedded, in, in embedded applications. Um, so um, there's been a whole sequence of works around designing very efficient, very uh, convolutional neural networks that have very, very low computational cost, but maybe are willing to sacrifice some accuracy and no longer beat these big residual networks. Um, one very famous example is this so-called mobile net. Um, and again, it has this idea of repeated blocks. So um, we can look at this basic three by three convolution on the left that has convolution batch norm ReLU. Um, as you should know by now, the, com the computational cost of this layer is nine C squared HW. Now on the right, um, we replace this convolution with two different convolutions. One is a so-called depth-wise convolution that, um, con that uh, you can look at the details, I think, offline. Uh, we don't have time to go through that. And there's been a whole uh, sequence of papers that have been trying to design very efficient neural networks that can run on mobile devices. So now at this point, it it's kind of seems that there's been a lot of activity around designing different neural network architectures, but it still takes a lot of work and a lot of human effort and a lot of human activity to design neural network architectures. So as another hint of something that has been very um, popular the last few years, has been automating this process of designing architectures and actually training one neural network that outputs the, the architecture of another neural network. Um, and we don't have time to go through the full details of this idea in this, in this lecture, but the basic idea is that we'll have one neural network called a controller, and this controller will output the architecture for another neural network. So then the training process here is that we'll take the controller network, we'll sample a bunch of architectures from the controller, we'll train all of those architectures on our data set, and then after we train all of those child networks, we'll see how well they did and use that to compute a gradient for the controller network. And the exact mechanism of computing that gradient requires a, is a policy gradient approach that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit later. But what that means is that after training a batch of child networks, then we can make a single gradient step on the controller. So then in order to perform gradient descent on that controller, it's going to be very, very, very computational expensive. But over time, this controller should learn to produce good neural network architectures. <coughs> um, the initial version, this was a really cool idea, but the initial version of this was just unbelievably computationally expensive. Because now each gradient step on the controller takes, uh, so the initial version of this trained on 800 GPUs for 28 days, and that is just an amount of computational resources that I'm sorry I cannot give you for your homework. Um, but, but if you're at Google and you've got free GPUs laying around, then this is the kind of uh, experiments that people are trying. But, uh, and, and follow-up research has, actually this, this paper has become kind of a joke in the community, just because the, the, the unbelievable scale of resources that were used in this paper. Um, but actually follow-up papers on neural architecture search have significantly reduced this uh, search time. Um, so, uh, but people always love to compare to this paper and say like, oh look, we're 10,000 times more efficient than this previous one. <laughs> if that's a good way to get your papers accepted. But um, the, the takeaway is that if you, are, if you have the resources to burn, then neural architecture search actually has been used to find neural network architectures which are themselves very efficient. So this is kind of another plot that is nice to summarize a lot of the architectures that we've seen um, so far in this lecture. So here on the x-axis, we're showing the computational cost of running the, the, running the neural network, um, that is the number of multiply adds, and the y-axis now is the, the accuracy on ImageNet. And you can see that um, this, all these dots correspond to different neural network architectures that we've talked about in this lecture. And all these red lines correspond to different neural network architectures that were learned using a neural architecture search method. And what you can see is that this neural architecture search method 
was able to learn a set of different architectures that um, achieved higher accuracy at, uh, at lower computational cost compared to other architectures. So that's, that's kind of a, a next frontier in neural network architecture design. And the kind of summary from what we've seen today is that in the kind of early days of convolutional neural networks, as we moved from AlexNet to ZFNet to VGG, people were just focused on training ever bigger and ever bigger neural networks in order to get higher and higher accuracies. Um, GoogleNet was one of the first to focus on efficiency. And in doing so, they wanted to get high accuracy while also being aware of the computational cost. Residual networks gave us a way to scale networks to become very, very big. And we were able to train layer, networks with hundreds of layers once we had this, this, these ingredients of batch normalization and residual networks. And after ResNet, people started to focus on efficiency more and more and more. And somehow that became the guiding principle of a lot of neural network architecture design after um, residual networks. So, um, so then uh, things, so then we, we saw this huge proliferation of different architectures that were trying to achieve higher or same accuracy um, at lower uh, computational cost. Um, this includes neural, uh, these tiny networks like mobile nets and shuffle nets. And neural architecture search promises to maybe one day design all of our no no networks for us. Um, but now the final question is, you know, this is all great, but what architectures should I actually use in practice? Well, my advice is don't be a hero. So for most applications, don't try to design your own neural network architecture. Um, you're going to cause yourself sadness, and you don't have 800 GPUs to burn for a month, I think. So what you should probably do in most situations is take an existing neural network architecture and adapt it for your problem. Um, and for that, and that's what I do in my research, and that's what I recommend you guys do for, your, for any projects that you undertake. Um, in particular, despite the number of things that have come after, I think ResNet, ResNet 50 and ResNet 101 are still really, really great solid choices that work. If, if you want something to just work and not have to fiddle with it too much, those are the choices that I usually grab for. If you are concerned about computational cost for some reason, then look to some kind of mobile net or shuffle net. But in general, you really shouldn't be trying to design your own neural network architectures. So um, that kind of is all the stuff we wanted to cover today. And next time, we'll talk about some of the actual software and hardware that we use to actually train these different networks. Thank you.